One of the most frustrating parts of any job search is that you don't know why you're getting rejected. And without that information, you can't change your approach to avoid mistakes. Well, today I got data on the real reasons why companies reject candidates, but they don't actually reveal. I'm going to warn you, it's not pretty and honestly kind of depressing to look at the data, but I want to share with you what I learned and what you can do about it. Throughout my career, I have gotten a bunch of job offers, both at startups and big tech. But the truth is that I have been rejected for far more jobs than I've been accepted into. Every time I fail an interview or I get ghosted, I feel the sting of rejection. But whenever I ask the recruiter for what happened or what I could do better, I never get a straight answer. And it kind of makes sense why, right? There's no real benefit to the company for revealing why they passed over a candidate. Either the candidate could get really upset and disagree with the feedback, or even worse, they might sue the company for discrimination if they feel like that reason was invalid. That's why I was over the moon excited to get my hands on hundreds of real rejection reasons from hiring managers and recruiters. I joined this platform where third-party recruiters submit their best candidates for open positions, mostly at startups. The company will then give feedback to the recruiter, of which I am one. And the reason this works is that there is an incentive alignment between the company and the recruiter because the recruiter needs that feedback to be able to provide better candidates for the company to hire. And that is the key unlock here. The company has a reason to be honest about what they're thinking. And that's what I want to share with you. To be clear, these are the unfiltered thoughts of the decision maker at the company about why they turned down a candidate. And the results are so juicy. The data I looked at had hundreds of engineering applicants across around 10 companies, all of them in the US, all of them with less than 500 people. Even with the recruiters submitting their best candidates, 59% were rejected at the time of submission, simply based on their profile. Another 20% were eliminated at the screening stage, which means they talked to someone from the company and then got rejected. These are the two parts of the funnel, the submission and screening, which I'm going to focus this video on because that's where you can get the maximum learning to apply to your own job search. One thing I want to call out is the difference in recruiting between a startup and a larger tech company. A lot of these startups are frankly delusional when it comes to their expectations. They want to find a unicorn candidate who is willing to work extremely hard for a salary that is likely below market rate. And they want this candidate to have gone to a top computer science program, worked at a hyper growth startup so they know what growth looks like, work at a big tech company so they can understand engineering best practices, and they want this candidate to care deeply about the mission of the startup. These companies are brutal about eliminating candidates who could have been a great fit. Here are my biggest takeaways. First, there's an enormous value placed on a candidate's pedigree, in particular where they went to school. I would have thought that if you're hiring someone with more than five years of experience, it doesn't really matter if they went to a top school or even if they went to school at all. But an embarrassingly large number of job description mandated that they only wanted candidates from a top 20 computer science program. I was also surprised by how broad a brush people paint when it comes to the quality of the company and what that says about the candidate. For example, I saw at least two hiring managers reject candidates who came from either PayPal or Oracle because they assumed that the engineering bar there is not very high. That means there's also a really strong bias against boot campers and non-traditional candidates, which very few people would say publicly, but it is obviously true from the data. The second insight I had is that there's a lot of guesswork around a candidate's trajectory based off of their LinkedIn or their resume. For example, one of the rejection reasons was lack of exceptional achievements or signs of excellence. Another very common rejection reason was frequent job hopping, which people would interpret as an unwillingness to stick through difficult times. What it boils down to is that the decision maker at the company is trying to create a story about who you are and what you've done. One candidate was literally rejected for the reason career break is a red flag. So you would think that working at a place which is traditionally considered a top company like Meta or Google would be a safe bet, right? Nope, not quite. Another pattern I saw is that if you stayed for too long at a top big tech company, then there would be either a discomfort or an inability to adapt to the startup environment. Experience too heavily skewed toward big tech was one of the very common reasons for rejection at the submission stage. Basically, there's an assumption here of inertia. If you've stayed for too long at the same level or the same company size, people think that you won't be able to change. Next, there's a very clear bias against anyone who was laid off or part of a RIF, reduction in force. One rejection reason was not a great fit, was caught up in his company's RIF, indicating he was not a top performer. This is why you need to be thoughtful about explaining each of your job transitions. And remember, you are empowered to withhold information if it doesn't benefit you. On the same note, there's a very negative reaction to people who have the open to work frame on their LinkedIn profile. 
One hiring manager literally wrote, outside the target years of experience and open to work red flag. It's pretty clear from all this that job seekers need all the help they can get. That's why for the past three years, I've been working on my startup called Taro. We are a course and community platform designed to help software engineers advance in their career. Whether that's job seeking, finding out a really good network or getting promoted at your current job. We have a ton of the most qualified people in the industry giving you insights and lessons from their decades long experience. Check it out at jointaro.com. Okay, you're probably listening to this and thinking that most startups seem completely irrational. And you'd be right. I think that these startups are going to end up having a very big delta between their theoretical ideal candidate and the practical reality of who they get to apply. But keep in mind that a startup is going to have fewer hiring needs compared to a big tech company. Instead of hiring 100 engineers in a month, they might only hire one. And that gives them the luxury to be picky and reject candidates where there might be a question mark about their history. So what does that mean for you? The most important piece of advice I have for you is to focus on storytelling. You need to be very thoughtful about what stories you are sharing about yourself and your career and what does that say about you. This is why referrals are incredibly important. Instead of being one of a hundred or a thousand applicants who are submitting information, a referral gives you the opportunity to add more color, more nuance to your profile because there's someone at the company who trusts you and can advocate for you. Based on the data of all of the rejection reasons I looked through, here is what I'd recommend. First, pedigree is important. I don't really care how much people talk about tech being completely meritocratic. That's just simply not true. If you have the ability to associate yourself with an important school or an important company, do it. And doing this early in your career will pay dividends for many years to come. Second, don't use the open to work frame on LinkedIn. In the world of recruiting, there's an idea that the best candidates are not desperate for a job. And the issue is that having the open to work frame on LinkedIn can be linked to desperation and therefore it can hurt you when you're looking for a job. Third, do not publicly broadcast that you've been part of a layoff. I'm not saying you should lie about it, but I am saying that you should be thoughtful about revealing that and adding color to what happened when you're actually engaging with a human and not before that. And that brings me to the insights from the engineers who made it to the screening stage, which means that their profile, their LinkedIn was impressive enough to talk to someone at the company, but then they got rejected. The number one rejection reason here was a concern about the candidates fit for this particular company. Didn't seem to have a ton of enthusiasm for the role or an idea of their career goals. Another rejection said, didn't have great reasoning for why he wants to start a new role or what his motivations are. This is again, where you need to have a very clear story about why you care about this startup in particular and how it'll fit into the broader narrative of your entire career. Unlike larger companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, we all know what products they produce and it's easy for us to come up with a reason about why it would be interesting to work there. But for a startup, by definition almost, they don't have the same awareness or credibility. And so you need to really be thoughtful about why you are willing to give up that and you want to go work at a startup and build something at a much earlier stage. My advice, if you're at the screening stage and you're talking to a human at the company, is number one, you need to make it very obvious that you are excited about this opportunity. And number two, you need to frame your past experience to make it relevant to this particular job. There's often more to learn from failure than success, which is why I was so excited to get my hands on hundreds of rejection reasons across many candidates and many companies. My initial reaction when I went through the data is that there's a lot of unfairness here. A lot of candidates are biased against for things they may not have much control over. But at least now that you know that this exists in the world and people have these biases, you can work to counteract them. Let me know what were the biggest takeaways for you based on the data I presented. And please share with other people in the comments, what advice would you have for other job seekers who are feeling demoralized? Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.